Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Next Center here in Fort Myers, Florida. Today I'm going to talk about how you at home can monitor your EKG and try to figure out is your palpitations, your dizziness, and other symptoms uh, from your neck. Because a lot of times when people have symptoms that are suggestive of a heart arrhythmia or they have dizziness with standing that they don't have with sitting down or laying down, which is called orthostatic hypotension, they often are referred to a cardiologist. And the cardiologist will look at the EKG. They might even have the person monitor themselves at home. So they have different chips and different things. Uh, when I was doing cardiology years and years ago, probably 30 years ago, we used what's called a Holter monitor. And often the Holter monitor would be negative. So today's talk is going to be really interesting to you. If you feel like you have symptoms that are coming from the neck that are causing like palpitations, tachycardia. I've even had patients who have come in here. They've been in their early 20s and already had a pacemaker. We're going to look at the dynamic EKG test results of a patient with symptoms of lightheadedness, dizziness, nausea, blurry vision, balance issues, uh, changes in their pupil, blood pressure and heart rate changes when they move their neck in a certain position, circulation issues, digestion issues, and the person had numbness in the hands and feet. So if I feel like the heart isn't pumping correctly or the heart rhythm is off because of the neck, we'll do what's called a dynamic EKG analysis. And then you've heard me say this before, but if you have a symptom or a condition or a diagnosis and nobody's telling you the cause of it, consider Hauser's Law, which says that you have to follow the neurology and the neurology will lead to ligamentous joint instability. So let's look at this as it relates to the heart because the heart is responsible for keeping your blood pressure at a good level and your heart rate at a good level. So every tissue of your body has enough blood, enough food, enough oxygen. So you could see that with motion, with athletics, with working on the computer, if you put your neck in a certain position and the nerve supply of the heart isn't correct, that the heart might have issues. So using Hauser's Law, what's the nerve supply to the heart? Well, it turns out the heart has a sympathetic nerve supply and a vagal nerve supply. So if somebody has tachycardia, like almost all arrhythmias that, that we see increase the heart rate. They don't decrease the heart rate. So increasing the heart rate, that would be like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, that would be uh, sinus tachycardia, any kind of tachycardia with palpitations, that, that would be POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia, right? Like what the person gets boom, 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 all of a sudden. So what, what probably is happening is whatever lowers the heart rate that is probably having trouble because the heart is going boom 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 well it turns out the vagus nerve is the nerve supply to the pacemakers of the heart so the pacemaker of the heart is the sa node so if we think about it as it relates to the vagus nerve the vagus nerve follows the anterior neck into the thorax, into the abdominal cavity. So ligamentous cervical instability is probably the cause of vagus nerve problems in the human body, including if the vagus nerve problem, vagus nerve dysfunction, vagus nerve degeneration is causing atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, ventricular arrhythmias, uh, bradycardia, tachycardia. And then if you look at here, the autonomic innervation of the heart. You have the vagus nerve, then you have the sympathetic system, and it goes to the heart, and 
the vagus nerve, that's in the anterior part of the neck, like I said. So any sort of bad change of the neck curve, that could affect the vagus nerve. And then the sympathetic trunk pretty much comes from the neck and the thoracic area. But usually the problem is that the vagal input to the heart isn't enough. So then the sympathetic system overtakes it and then the person gets tachycardia. So when you eliminate the vagus input to the heart, the heart rate in a human being will go up to 170. It's mostly your left vagus nerve, but if you blocked your vagus nerves, your heart rate would go up to 170. And I can tell you when I was an elite athlete, so basically there was a time period where I was an elite athlete. I remember doing the half marathon in Naples and I did my PR at the time. So my PR at that time was like 137. And my average heart rate for the, the, one, the one hour and 37 minutes was 172. Right? So in, in elite shape, I could handle a heart rate of 172 for one and a half hours. I'm telling you right now, I'm not in an elite shape. So if my heart rate went up to 170, boom, 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 I would absolutely go to the emergency room, you know, I, because you can't, I can't tolerate that for very long. Otherwise, I'm going to have a heart attack or something. So that's why people zoom to the zoom to the ER when they have, all of a sudden they have tachycardia because it can be life-threatening. Okay, so there's lots of different devices that you can get. I even have a stethoscope. I have a stethoscope that I put, the stethoscope I use where I put it to do a heart exam and then on the top of it, it has the person's EKG. So literally with my stethoscope, I could have the person uh, moving their head and I could see the changes in their EKG in real time. Well, you know, you can get different devices. So we see this person, they have a certain device on, then we're looking at the EKG in real time. And what we do in the office is we have you hold a position, a neck position for 30 seconds, then we do the EKG. So you could do this at home. So in this particular patient, you see that in the neutral position, they had one abnormal heartbeat, but the rest of the heartbeats were normal. Extension, fine, ooh, flexion. See, now you have two in a row. And if you start getting extra beats in a row, that's what leads to an arrhythmia. And then the more beats you have in a row, that's the more likelihood you're gonna feel it, like the thump, the thump, and we call that palpitations. So we turn the head to the right, we had what? In this one, one, two, three abnormal beats, retraction, none, protraction, you started to get more. And then this was the golden ticket. So when the person flexed and rotated to the left, boom, ba-boom, 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 right? And you could see where even a cardiologist would say that you have that many PVCs in a row that could lead to ventricular tachycardia, which is a life-threatening arrhythmia. So, so again, anybody who has lightheadedness, dizziness, uh, palpitations, POTS, you've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, atrial flood, or any other uh, paroxysmal atrial uh, arrhythmia, ventricular arrhythmia, you just know that there's something wrong with your heart and this is an easy thing that you can do. You can do it at home or you come to a clinic like ours and then we monitor you and then we figure out. Now, the question is then what can you do about it? Well, you know as well as I do, if, I'll give you an example. So say somebody, they don't wanna flex and rotate to the left. So if the person was left-handed and their mouse was on the left side, then I would have them switch their mouse to the right. So I get, I, I get some things like this, so I, but mine is when I flex and I rotate to the right. So I, I, even though I'm right-handed, I change my mouse to the left. So just the person knowing that flexion and rotation to the left. You might say, well, what was happening with this person? Well, there was times where the person would wake up with this tachycardia, like boom, 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 boom. Well, think about it. The person has pillows here. They have pillows here, now they're flexed. Then if the head rotates to the left, 
you know, they're going to get boom, 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 boom. So then we change the person's sleeping position. Then if the person works on a computer, obviously a lot of people don't realize, you know, they're bent forward when they're working on the computer. And then if you look to the left, like, you know, that you could have something, papers you're looking at or whatever. Well, then now you're in the flexed left rotated position. So then we change the person's workstation and they're, they're doing really, really well. So this is like looking at all the EKGs that they had and you could tell that the main danger zones for this person I'd say is flexion and then flexion with left rotation. And then you might say, well, why is that? Well, those are the positions that were compressing the vagus nerve the most. I don't think since we saw the person that they've had any more issues with the tachycardia or the arrhythmia. So obviously getting their computer screen high, then the better their neck curve is, the less likely this is gonna happen if they do get into that neck position. So again, the other take home point of this is that why don't you do a lateral neck x-ray to make sure that your neck curve is good enough, and if it isn't do exercises and other things to uh, get your neck curve good. This person had a breakdown of their neck curve, which we call cervical destructure. And that was from some ligamentous injury, some ligamentous cervical instability. So they're getting that treated with prolotherapy. This is a very important slide. It's unbelievable the things that the vagus nerve does to the heart. So it means that if you do, if you look at these things, and you think of the opposite, that's what occurs with people who have ligamentous cervical instability and breakdown of the neck curve. Give you an example. So, uh, so decreased heart inflammatory markers. So in other words, the heart doesn't, isn't inflamed. Well, if the vagus nerve is injured, there's vagus nerve dysfunction, then you're gonna have inflammatory markers that are all throughout the heart. See where it says greater left ventricular contraction. So in other words, elite athletes, runners, football players, you know, their heart just has unbelievable amount of contractility. So there's so much blood going to their body. So when your vagus nerve is strong, the heart muscle is just so strong. So if you have cervical vagopathy, vagus nerve degeneration, vagus nerve dysfunction, guess what? You know, instead of like this, the heart, it's not pumping as strong as it would be. So what would that cause? Well, that would cause dizziness. That would cause lethargy, like I can't do anything. You know, I, I'm not as energetic as I think I should be. I have chronic fatigue, right? Chronic fatigue. Then it looks at, you know, improved heart blood flow, right? Somebody has angina. They're on nitroglycerin. They're on so many heart medications because the blood supply of the heart's bad. Well, I'm not saying diet doesn't play a role or emotions don't play a role, but sometimes we forget the vagus nerve plays a role. So the vagus nerve, when it's strong, the blood supply to the heart is optimized if you have vagus nerve degeneration. So what are some other symptoms of, of vagus nerve degeneration? Well, another symptom would be your digestive tract isn't working good. You're more anxious than you normally are. Like, like we said, you had tachycardia. You could have uh, orthostatic hypotension because the vagus nerve and its buddy, the glossopharyngeal nerve, they monitor blood pressure. So if, there are, if you're somebody who has hypertension or you're having horrible blood pressure swings, it's likely that you have vagus nerve degeneration. In the office here, what we do is beside this test, we actually measure the vagus nerves. And what we find is that when you have vagus nerve induced heart problems, normally your vagus nerves are very, very small. And then the good news is that when you correct your neck curve, you stabilize the neck with prolotherapy, lifestyle changes to be a calmer, more positive person instead of take going to the dark side or letting stress uh, affect you. 
the vagus nerve then can regenerate and we actually see the vagus nerves get bigger. So, I, so you should be encouraged, like even if you have this going on, you absolutely can correct it, but it's gonna start with, you have to get your neck posture really good, you know, get your computer set up. One other thing I just wanna mention is increased nitric oxide in the ventricles. So nitric oxide is the main chemical in the human body that increases blood flow and you know, even a couple of days ago, I had a physical therapist from Boston area, who's a longtime patient of ours, was just talking about infrared and different things that he does in his clinic that helps patients get over pain and all kinds of things. And the mechanism of a lot of this is nitric oxide. So if you research, you know, Google search nitric oxide, nitric oxide helps the brain, helps the peripheral the joints, helps the body, so the tissues have a good blood supply. Well, sometimes we forget the electrical uh, computer that monitors that and stimulates that is the vagus nerve. So again, Hauser's Law, if you have a symptom or condition or diagnosis that's elusive, if you follow the neurology, the neurology will lead to ligamentous joint instability. And you know, I think the ligamentous joint instability that's forgotten the most and is the most significant is cervical instability. And you might say, well, doc, how, do, how would I know that? Well, you know, if you have clicking, popping, grinding of your neck, if you had heart symptoms or dizziness or lightheadedness or brain fog, and it occurred after a trauma, or it occurred after you were working on a project at work for hours and hours and weeks and weeks, and you had really bad posture, you know, it's probably coming from your neck. So the treatment has to be directed at the neck, which typically involves just getting your curve good, change your computer height, uh, you know, sleep in a position, not where your neck's you know, corked forward, but sleep in a position where your neck posture is in a good position or get a cervical neck pillow. And we check these things when patients come to see us as to, you know, what kind of sleeping position and what kind of pillow is gonna work well. But I'm just here to encourage you, you absolutely can overcome this. And as always, I wish you the best of health.